Hello, everyone. So excited to be here with you today for the start of a brand new chapter in the Tank Talk podcast. You're seeing here, if you're watching this in video form, my new co-host with me, Mr. Jason Adams. Welcome. I'm so very glad to have you here with me to help steer me in the right direction when it comes to aquarium podcasting. Well, I'm not sure about that. You're the expert in Aquarium Podcast, not me, but I am very, really excited to be here. This is going to be awesome. We've been talking about this for a while, been looking forward to it. We have got a lot to talk about both today and in the coming weeks and months. So it's, yeah, this is going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun. I hope everybody who's listening enjoys it as well. I think they will because between the two of us, and we're going to talk about our histories with fish keeping today, between the two of us, I think we have enough stories to where we could probably keep people occupied for years and years to come, uh, particularly the way I like to tell a story, which is a little bit uh, in depth and, and maybe maybe a bit too far. But that's the way I do things. Um, this is I, I want to be very clear of how this is working. This podcast is available on all podcasting platforms as well as in video form on YouTube. If you're listening to this on audio, sometimes you may hear us, like I just did a few minutes ago, referencing uh, Jason is right next to me on the camera. He's not sitting next to me, but he's uh, in, in his house and I'm in mine, but we're next to each other on the screen. We're going to do our best to make you aware of if we are showing something, which we're going to try not to do, but if we do, uh, we're going to try to help our audio listeners understand what it is that we're talking about. And this is not a Jason Adams from Primetime Aquatics doing a guest appearance on John from KG Tropicals podcast. This is a brand new start to this podcast where Jason, the professor, I so badly want to refer to you as the professor, uh, is the permanent new co-host of this. Jason and I are doing this 50-50 right down the middle. And so he is as much an owner and part of this podcast as I am. We're starting over from scratch. Anything that you know about the Tank Talk podcast is about to change, except for the fact that I am on it with Jason. Um, it's new beginnings. I'm so excited. I finally have my Robin Quivers with me. Uh, to, <laughs> I don't even know who that is. <laughs> that would be Howard Stern's co-host of oh, the Howard Stern Show. Okay, that would explain uh, why. Robin has lost. been, yeah, she's been with him since the beginning of, of his show. And okay. um, so, yeah, you're you're the female co-host on yeah, my show. Right. <laughs> OK, well, now that we've got that settled. <laughs> but I, I have to clarify that, because if I say Robin, then that automatically means like I'm Batman, you're Robin. No, it's not that Robin. It's it's another Robin. But but anyway, um, like I said, I, and I don't want to dominate this conversation. Like I said, we're starting over from scratch. We're going to start this as if you, the listeners, have absolutely no clue who either of us are. Uh, you may have been a follower of this podcast for a long time. You know me pretty well. And if you know me, you already know Jason, too. But we wanted to take today's episode to introduce ourselves all over again to you by telling you our introduction to this hobby, uh, how it all started and what kind of an impact it's had on our lives. And I think it's appropriate with you, Jason, excuse me, professor being, do you have a problem with me calling you professor? All my students do. So it's not something that I've never heard before. So good. I just, I so badly want to call you that. I, I think because you are coming into this for the first episode as the new co-host, I think it's appropriate for you to tell your story first. All right, so it all started back in 1912. And back in those <laughs> days, all right, no, maybe not quite that far. All right, let's fast forward brrr, all the way to around probably 1978 or 79. So I got my start when I was a little child. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with me, you might have heard part of this story before, but I was, I was about six years old and I wanted a pet. And my parents at the time, they didn't really want to commit to anything that was going to be too time consuming, like, you know, an animal running around the house. So we decided that I, I don't know if it was for like anything in particular. I think we just went one day, like it wasn't like for a birthday or anything. We just went to a pet store and I was going to pick out a fish. 
And so I remember being a little bitty kid and I still remember one of the things that inspired me to keep fish was this pet store, this first pet store that I ever went to. And it had all the dry goods in front. And then in the back, you could see almost like this hexagon shaped room. The walls were painted black. The tanks were all within the walls and they were stacked about three high, but it was all dark. There were no lights in the room. The only lights that were there were the lights from the aquariums. And so it was, it left a huge impo impact on me as a child. So I walked back into this room with my mom and I remember being small because I remember like looking way up at my mom and you know, I look back at it now. She was probably only like five, six. So <laughs> everything was much larger. And I don't know, the room seemed huge. But then again, when you're a kid, it probably wasn't the, the place probably wasn't as big as I thought it was or that it really was. So I'm looking at fish and I remember the, the guy was like, oh, why don't you get a goldfish? They're easy to take care of. They don't need a lot of equipment. And so, again, don't judge me, bro. We're here. It's the <laughs> 1970s. This is the way fish keeping was done. I got a, I was looking at all these goldfish, all, all these little fancy goldfish. And there was one in particular. It was the only one in the tank. It was a black fancy goldfish. And that's the one I wanted. Now, it just so happened that this fish was missing an eye. So it was like straight up. It had one eye and then it had like a little dot where the other eye was supposed to be. And I'm like, I want that one. And both, I remember both my mom and the pet store guy was both, were both like, are you sure that's the one you want? I'm like, yeah, that's the best looking one. I'm like, like, well, you know, it's, it's missing an eye. I'm like, I don't care. It just looks cool. So I got this little black fancy goldfish and appropriately I named it Popeye. So nice. I got, the, yeah, I got this little black fancy goldfish and I got this little goldfish bowl. Cause again, that's what you did back then. Uh, no, no equipment, no heaters, no filters. What we were told back then is you get this this goldfish bowl and you put some gravel in it and you put a decoration right there in the center and then you would do water changes every once in a while and they said hey just take your your tap water put it in some gallon jugs leave it out to sit so that all the chlorine dissipates and then you can use that to do your water changes and basically you would just dump all the you take the goldfish put it in a cup dump all the water out and then put new water in again we we didn't know about you know all the cycle and the beneficial bacteria and all that stuff. And that goldfish lived for, I don't know exactly, but it lived for a decently long time. But then as when that happened, it was like game on at that point. I love fish. And, and I think my parents started to warm up the idea warm up to the idea of having fish as well, because not that long after I wound up with a 10 gallon tank. I'm pretty sure at that point, again, my memory as a child, the goldfish might have passed. And we got the 10 gallon aquarium to kind of replace the goldfish because the goldfish never went in that tank. And so from that point on, it's like, okay, now we've got one aquarium and we had all, you know, I, I don't remember what kind of fish were there, just your normal community fish, but it, it started to snowball very, very quickly. So it's like, okay, we've got the 10 gallon aquarium. And then I remember, and for those of you who remember this time period, I got a 20 gallon from like my mom's cousin. Now this 20 gallon, the background, was like this flake gold paint and it had like all these wavy like lines in it. It was straight up like 1970s. I'm sure if you saw that tank today, you'd be like, that might be the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. And it didn't matter because it was a 20 gallon. It seemed enormous to me as a kid. I'm like, now I got this 10 gallon, but now I have a 20 gallon over here. And I specifically remember getting the little guy, like the little bubble chest that would open up and the bubble would come out and you get the little thing that says no fishing, that little mm -hmm. decoration. Uh, and I remember all that stuff. I remember the box filters. I was just talking about this on a live stream this week where the, the box filters were the pretty much the way to go where you had those little green and clear plastic things. You'd put the floss in there with the charcoal, uh, the activated carbon, and you change that out after it started looking nasty. And we had the 10, we had the 20, and then I remember we got a 30 gallon. The 30 gallon was our Imbuna cichlid tank. Again, nice. don't judge me here. This is just the way it was done back then. And I can remember my dad and I, we would go to the pet store every week and we would get two Imbuna cichlids because back then that was what the pet store guy told us to do. I mean, you're thinking about this right? and you're like, oh my gosh, this is just a whole checklist of things not to do. Putting Imbuna in a 30 gallon, getting pears. Uh, so we had this this 30 gallon aquarium filled with gravel and my mom wanted to do a red white and blue themed gravel tank where it was like red on the left hand side white in the center blue on the right America. which looked awesome i remember when we first set up it looked really cool 
The problem is she didn't realize that Imbuna liked to dig. Well, none of us did. We didn't know that. We just threw them in the tank and all of a sudden they're digging, they're mixing up everything. Within like three weeks, she's like, she was all upset. She's like, this, they ruined my aquarium. They're digging and they're missing. And then at first she was trying to like put all the pieces of individual gravel back in the, the proper spot in the tank. And that was a losing battle. After just oh a my. couple of weeks, she gave up. And here's the craziest part about that aquarium. I specifically remember having two erratus and one of them, of course, turned basically black. I remember having two Kenii, two yellow labs, possibly two red zebra. So we had two of all these things. Again, this is a 30 gallon aquarium and they were just constantly fighting. I learned a really important lesson with that aquarium as a, as a small child. And that lesson was don't throw in bluegill in an Imbuna tank. Oh, I didn't know. I mean, I'm just a kid, right? So we're at the Creek and we're catching fish. And I would, I remember I'd catch guppies. I'd throw those in the 20. I knew better than to throw the guppies in the Imbuna tank. So I'd throw those in the 20 and they lived a really long time. They'd have babies in there. Some of the males back then, even from, I remember catching the fish from the Creek were really pretty. So I got this bluegill, which was considerably larger than the Imbuna. And I chucked it in this tank and within a day that poor fish was just absolutely getting beat on. So I remember having to take it out and throwing it back in the Creek. I'm like, okay, that didn't work. Uh, so <laughs> we, and John, I know you're probably the same way when, when you're keeping fish at a younger age, pre-internet, you're figuring these things out as you go. Mm -hmm. You're hoping that whoever you're buying the fish from are telling you the right things that they're giving you good advice. Like, oh, put two and keep in Buna in pairs and put them all in a 30 gallon and everything's going to be okay. It wasn't okay. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, here, here's your red tail shark. And you can put that in with your guppies, your platies, your mollies and your quarry cats. And that's going to be okay. And we learned really fast as a child, that those red tail sharks get really mean as they grow up. Same with rainbow sharks. You learn that your opaline grommy that looks really cool. When you try to put four or five of them in a 20 gallon, that after a while, after usually a couple of weeks, doesn't work. So there was no reference point. There was just people selling you fish. And a lot of them knew, but and a lot of them didn't even ask the questions, right? And we didn't know the right questions to ask. And so if we went to a pet store and said, hey, I've got this 20 gallon, you know, they didn't necessarily ask us, go, hey, what's in your 20 gallon? Here's your red tail shark. I'll go chuck it in your community tank and, and, yep. and watch what happens as a result. Mm -hmm. So I basically grew up with with those fish. And I would say not only having the fish, but as you fast forward and think about, okay, well, why did I ever want a fish room? People ask that all the time, had up to 80 aquariums in our fish room. I can remember uh, going to the pet store and wanting to, to replicate that, that, that early childhood memory. But not only that, but going to my uncle's house, my uncle had a basement and he had all kinds of fish tanks down there. And he was breeding tons and tons of South and Central American cichlids. He had African cichlids. He had these really, now I think back at now, like, there were some pretty rare tanks that he had. He had a 90 gallon hex. I think he had two of those. He had these really big, like 60 or 70 gallon column tanks, uh, number of 75 gallons, 125s. And I would just go down there and all of my my cousins and my brother, they'd be up playing and I'd be down in this basement with the lights off, but just the tank lights on and just sitting on his couch be like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, just And he had, I think that was the first person who had clown loaches where I was like, these fish are awesome. I want clown loaches. And they were huge. They were at least 10 inches. But yeah, it was that was a really cool experience. And I pretty much from that point forward, always had fish. It's you know, continuously in, in my life. I'm, I, even when I started moving out of the house at the age of 17, 18, 19 years old, I remember having a 35 gallon hex and I had a 75 gallon. And so I put some just ridiculous fish in that 35 gallon hex again, because we're still talking about the nineties. We're still talking about mostly pre-internet. And I had those aquariums wound up getting married in the, you know, what 2001 and i remember when when my wife joanna when she met me i had the the hex i had the 75 gallon i might have had one other in this apartment and uh, e even from there she would be like looking at the tanks like wow you really like fish huh and thinking back i'm like she probably thought i was a weirdo man with having three aquariums in this little one bedroom apartment uh, and what was cool about that is that kind of shaped who i was right uh, in terms of my interest so having the aquariums and then as a kid 
I did what a lot of kids did in the 70s and 80s, and I spent almost most of my life at the creek catching stuff, frogs, fish, crayfish, snakes, you name it. I had tons of stuff. And the, the general rule was with the amphibians and lizards and snakes, they had to stay outside the house. So the fish could come in, everything else. My mom was like, the other stuff has to stay in the garage or whatever. And we'd basically keep the stuff all summer. And then as it, as the end of the summer started rolling around, school started, we released the stuff back in the nature. Uh, we'd pretty much do that every year. So that kind of shaped my interest level. And then sure enough, when I went to college, I, I thought I was going to major in business because I was working for a company and they're like, you know what? I started to move up in this company and I started to have like a, a, a managerial role. I'm like, you know, it'd go good with this a college degree. <laughs> and so I, I thought I was going to major in business. And I, I, I did that for about a, a semester. And then I took a, a, I enrolled in a non-majors biology course and I loved it. And I realized, okay, I'm going to switch my major. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I am going to switch from business because first of all, everybody I was working with was miserable. I'm like, well, I don't want to be old and 40 and miserable like those guys are. You know, keep in mind, I'm like in my mid twenties at the time, early twenties. And uh, so 40 years old seemed very old to me. <laughs> so I, I, I switched, I majored in biology, I minored in chemistry. And even at that point, I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do, but I know I loved living things. And my, my interests would change. I'm like, I want to do pre-med, pre-vet, pre-dental, pre-farm, PhD. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But then as I transitioned from my undergrad degree in biology to my master's program, uh, I, I started to realize that I, I love teaching. And so I, I majored in, in um, biotechnology and chemical science, became a professor starting in 2007. I've taught, I taught my students, I've taught every ology known to man except for anatomy and physiology. But uh, my background, at least in terms of teaching, is primarily microbiology. But I've taught a lot of parasitology, virology, biology of mammals, general zoology, environmental bio, genetics, organismal bio, um, forgetting some general zoology. So yeah, it, it's my my early fish keeping year is kind of shaped not only my interests, my hobbies, but it shaped my career path. And so now I've got basically two things that I do that really I don't even consider jobs. One is teaching and the other is is posting videos on YouTube about fish that I would absolutely have regardless of whether or not I shot a single video. When, when I built the fish room, so if we fast forward into around, I don't know, the 2000 and teens, I decided that I wanted to build a fish room. Now, here's a great story. Originally, where if you've ever seen my fish room, where the, the low boy is with the Maltese, when we moved into this house, that was Joanna's craft room. That was my wife's craft room. And so she had, if you know anybody who crafts, they tend to collect a lot of stuff. And that room was covered in just crafting type stuff. And I remember her saying, now on the other side of the on the other side of the basement where the other side of the fish room is, we had already like eight or ten tanks down there. She comes to me one day and she's like, you know what? I don't like being in the basement. It's dark. I can't see anything. I can't see outside. I don't want to be down there anymore. Can I have the loft? Which is where we're doing this, where I'm talking now is from the loft, which is our our YouTube studio. She's like, Can we switch? Because I had this as like an office. And I'm like, Oh yeah, we can switch. <laughs> I am not exaggerating. She was away at work at the time. My teaching schedule was such that either that or I was off. No, I was off. It was, it was a, in between semesters. I was home. I had the boys. Now at the time, the boys were probably seven and maybe six and nine or something like that. I'm like, listen guys, mommy wants to switch. Let's get all of her stuff up in the loft and all my stuff down in the basement. We did that before she got home from work. <laughs> two children and an adult man cleared out a massive amount of stuff in a huge room. And I'm like, she comes home. She's like, what happened? I'm like, the <laughs> you loft said. is yours. <laughs> yep. You said the loft is yours. The basement is mine. She's like, now she's getting scared. All right now she's wondering, why did you do that so quickly? That was obviously a lot of work. She's like, what? So um, she almost didn't want to ask me. She's like, what do you what do you want to do in the basement? Are you going to make it like a man cave or, or what do you, what do you want to do? You're going to put a TV down. I'm like, well, we have a TV on the other side. I was like, I was thinking more fish room. Now I didn't know how she was going to respond to that. 
she just looked at me. She's like, well, whatever. It's your area now. And I was like, game on. And so from that point forward, I started building it out. I started building the racks and building the water change system. And we didn't have any, uh, we didn't have a sink down there. So we didn't have any running water. So I had to get, I had to call plumber out and do all of that. And we, I built out the fish room and I, by the way, I did that all with zero expectation of ever posting a single video. It never even crossed my mind. I knew, you know, at that point, obviously your YouTube channel, uh, John, your KG Tropicals channel was well established as well as a few others, but I just, I, I had no intention or desire to post videos until one day my boys were down in the fish room after it was all done. Cause that would have been a lot of good video back then, but it was done. <laughs> And they're like, dad, why don't you put, because we were talking about fish and I was, they were asking me all these questions about different types of fish and all these different tanks. And I was telling them, why don't you put this stuff on YouTube? Like, you know, the other people do that you watch. I'm like, nah. And but the first time they mentioned it, I put it off. I put it off for probably six, eight, maybe 10 months where I was just like, nah, that's just not something. And so one day they were really hounding me about it because they wanted to do a YouTube channel with me. They're like, let's just do a YouTube channel. So I learned a couple lessons. One. Uh, when little kids ask you about doing something like that, they are not always fully 100% committed. Right? That's why you don't see them on our, on our videos. But so I asked them, I said, listen, if we're going to do this, we've got to do it right. We have to come up with a name. We have to come up with ideas. And so we sat there and we came up with all these YouTube channel names. And uh, all of a sudden, Joanna was involved because she was crafty at the time. So she wanted to do like a logo. And so we settled on a name. And John, this is probably not going to surprise you, but we sat there and we came up with 200 video ideas uh, that oh. day alone. So I'm like, okay, if I do two videos a week, which is what I wanted to do, I'm good for the next couple of years. And I was. <laughs> so, um, and it was, that changed everything as well because we went from always having a reasonable amount of aquariums. So for a lot of you who are like, I've got two, I've got three, I've got four, I've got seven, eight, less than 10. To me, that's a reasonable amount. That's a normal amount for an average hobbyist, or maybe not average, but certainly people who are going to be listening to this podcast. So uh, when we got the other side of the fish room and I had, I don't know, I added 30 aquariums and then I'm like, okay, now that I have this, I traveled over to the other side of the fish room that had the, the second low boy and had all the seating. And I'm like, I'm going to build that out now. So eventually we got up to 80 tanks Wow! and it, it got to be a lot. And so we fast forward into the last few years, what was happening was we transitioned from just having videos on YouTube to actually breeding a fair amount of fish, which started getting us involved in like local fish swaps. And then I quickly realized I cannot breed enough fish, even with the number of tanks I have and the fish that I enjoy breeding to supply the demand. And so a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, we started importing fish which necessitated that a lot of our fish room be converted from display tanks into quarantine tanks, which is kind of what they were anyway at that point. And so we started importing a lot of fish. And as of today, we've actually kind of taken a step back because now years later, so I think we've had the YouTube channel up and running for about seven years. And the fish room itself has been up for, I don't know, I think we got to start a couple of years before that. Now my older son is in school himself and he's getting busy. He's got his own job. And now it's like, okay, well, what do we do with 80 aquariums? Cause I'm looking at Joanna and I'm like, if we have to maintain, if he decides as he rightly should be able to decide, Hey, I, I'm busy. I can't do like one of the things that happens in our fish room is I want to be very upfront. I don't maintain any of those aquariums and I haven't maintained those aquariums for years and years and years. It's been my two boys from the time they were little, you know, no, don't get me wrong. They're not just do your chores. Here's a the tanks. They are employees of primetime aquatics and they get paid to do so but i don't maintain those tanks and if i had to i would i've always said i would not have as many as i do now and sure enough as i started to look at luke's schedule and the fact that he was going to school he needs to focus on his schoolwork he's already got a full-time job he doesn't need a full-time job a part-time job and almost full-time school i started to look at okay what happens if he decides I don't want to do this anymore. And now Joanna and I have 40 aquariums to maintain while Eli maintains his 45. That takes us all day. I'm like, I'm not dedicating an entire day to aquarium maintenance. So we decided a couple of things. One, let's scale back. Let's take that side of the fish room, which by the way, at that point really wasn't serving a good purpose because yeah, there were some quarantine tanks there and yeah, there were supposed to be some display tanks there, but 
you know, it really, they really weren't all that appealing to look at. So we decided let's pull all those aquariums out. We're going to keep the five of uh, five biggest ones, two 125s, two 75s, a 50 gallon low boy, and make that more of a gallery feel. Open it up, not stack tanks three high, but make it really, really nice and a place to go and relax, quiet, comfortable. And by the way, if you are watching this on YouTube, probably in the next month or two, you're going to see a different background. And so if you're watching this on a podcast, my background right now is similar to what we do on our live streams, but that's all going to change. And so we still import lots of fish, but now we've used the fish room side of the fish room that still has 40 aquariums to do all of that quarantine. So that is pretty much a synopsis of, of my life in aquarium keeping. And here we are today kicking out a, a podcast talking about awesome things. So Hopefully that didn't bore everybody to sleep, John. I'm sorry if it did, because now I've got we've got people who are sleeping, and now you're going to tell your story, and you got to wake them back up. So good luck. No, they're not gonna they're not gonna wake back up when I tell my story. They're gonna enter that deep REM sleep state because. <laughs> yeah, but my... what you don't understand is I have a history of hearing from my students. I put on your videos, your lecture videos, and it helps me go to sleep. I too I hear have heard that all the time. So <laughs> I've heard that right, not, obviously, obviously I'm not doing lecture videos like you are, but I've heard pe I've had people tell me that they listen to my videos and, and live streams and things like that when they're trying to go to sleep. So yeah, we're, we're both good at, uh, getting people to relax, I guess. Um, my story is very, very different. Uh, it starts much later. Now I could, I could talk about the 20 gallon long that I had in my bedroom when I was probably around the same age, you know, under 10, I'm not even sure because I remember it, but I also don't like, I remember having a couple of goldfish in there. Uh, they were not fancy. They were, they were either comets or common. I don't know the difference between the two. Didn't even realize there was comet and common goldfish. I thought they were all comets, but anyway, I remember having that tank. I don't remember doing anything to it. Um, all I remember is the fish all died eventually. I had it for a while and I picked up a turtle from the creek and uh, I don't remember what kind of turtle it was. It was small. I put it in that 20 gallon tank and it lived in there for like three or four years and then it passed away. And I vividly remember crying when that turtle passed away. Give me a break. I was like nine when that happened. But um, aside from that, my story doesn't start, <clears throat> excuse me, until I'm 19 years old. Uh, I was working for a cable television company. I got this job. Uh, I was actually supposed to take over my family business and that didn't work out. The recession of the early nineties, I graduated high school in 1992. Um, my dad's business that I and my brothers were, my brother and brother-in-law were supposed to take over. Uh, we graduated, I graduated in June, the company shut down in September, um, because of that recession that happened. So I went and got a job at a cable company. My boss at the cable company, his name was Arthel Clark. He went by art. This is a guy that had more of an impact on my life than he even knows. I haven't talked to him in, well, basically since 94, I guess, um, he was one of those figures in my life that didn't know he was doing it, but he was molding me into what I've become now. And he wasn't even trying. It was just the way he was. He was a guy that was very unique and a very free spirited guy. Like nothing bothered him. He was just as, as happy go lucky as, uh, as, as anyone could be. The reason why I'm talking about my boss is because he is the one that ended up getting me into fish keeping. Uh, and, and he didn't do it intentionally. It just kind of happened organically because we became friends. Um, he, the reason why he was so happy and, and so just such a free person was because he was extraordinarily wealthy. Um, and you know, I knew this at the time because he told me about it. Um, and I feel it necessary to very briefly explain how, a man or supervisor at a cable television company who was probably making $35,000 a year was an extremely wealthy guy because, you know, you could start thinking there's some shady things going on there. Uh, he used to be 
a, a contractor that would hang cable wires onto utility poles. Most people call them telephone poles. I don't know how much of those you have out there in, in the city where you live, but uh, especially out here where I'm at uh, in the rural areas, everything is up on poles. He was on a pole one day, and this was uh, three or four years before I met him. Uh, he was a contractor, and his job was to go up onto the pole and hang these wires up onto the pole. Uh, cable wire, wires to run cable throughout neighborhoods. So he went up there one day and he went up on the pole on what's called hooks, where you see the guys sticking their feet into the into the poles. That's what he did. He didn't have a ladder. He didn't have a strap, nothing like that. You would basically use the hooks to climb up the pole, digging your hooks into the pole, get up there. And then when you're up there, you strap a, a, a strap around the the wire and that's what holds you up so he's up there and he's holding on to what's called the guide wire when we're talking about cable television they don't just zip tie a wire up to uh, utility poles you have what's called a guide wire which is a very thick steel I guess cable galvanized that runs from pole to pole and then you tie the actual coaxial cable to that guide wire. So he's up there holding on to this guide wire for support. And what you would normally do in his situation is you would tie the cable to your belt so that you have both hands free. You tie the cable to your belt, you climb up the pole, and then you take the cable from your belt and you put it up. Well, he forgot to take the cable up with him. So he had a helper that was down on the ground with him or a partner I don't know I don't know the story behind the guy that was on the ground and he said throw that up to me and the guy said no problem I got you now in a in a power pole utility pole telephone pole situation you've got the high voltage power lines up on the top very very top then you've got the telephone lines below that and then you've got the cable television lines or sometimes they're flip-flopped but the power lines are always up top and these are carrying the kind of power that would blow you up if you touched them. I think you see where this story's going. His partner was on the ground and he, being the genius that he was, thought it would be smart to tie a hammer to the cable so that he could swing it like a lasso and release it and throw it up to Art, who was 40 feet up the pole. So he did that. Art's up there. He looks down. I wasn't there, but I'm just going by what Art told me. He, Art looks down and he sees him swinging it like one, two, three, go. And he says, no, but it was too late. And the guy released the cable. It flew up, draped over top of the power line, came down and that hammer hit the guide wire that Art was holding on to. And I'm not going to get graphic, but he basically blew up on top of that pole. He was strapped into the pole and basically was you know, fell backwards, but the, the strap was holding him up and he hung there and the rescue squad had to go up there and, and get him down. And they thought he was dead. They thought it was a dead body up there on the pole because it was literally like a lightning strike. Um, and it, it was very graphic. So he didn't die, obviously. Um, he, the, the, the voltage went through him and exploded out of his right shoulder. Um, Art, was happy to be alive. And that's why he was such a happy person and such a high energy person. He was thankful to be alive. And because of that accident, he was also extraordinarily wealthy. Uh, millions. I don't, I never knew how much money he had, but it, he was like, part of the reason why I love my job is because I don't have to come to my job every day. And that, that had a huge impact on me back then too. Like, you know, if I, you'd be in your 30s talking about if I won the lottery, I'd quit my job day one. And I'd be like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to quit because I remember Art telling me how easy it was to go into work every single day when you don't have to. So he was a very happy, even though he went through this absolute torture that he went through. Um, the best way that I could describe the way he looked, you couldn't tell to look at him. Uh, he was an African-American gentleman. You could not look at him and say, oh, oh, what happened to him? Everything that happened to him was from his neck down to his abdomen. Um, 
so he wore long sleeve shirts year round because his skin was very sensitive to the sun. I was in a locker room with him one time. We were playing basketball. He took his shirt off to change his shirt. And the way I could describe it is, if you've ever seen the movie Deadpool, that's what he looked like. Um, that's what his body looked like. And so anyway, he was happy to be alive. He was grateful to be given another chance at life. He was very wealthy. So he was a very happy guy, Con you know, even though he went through what he went through. He decided one day, he called me up on the radio. That's what we used to use to communicate with each other was Breaker Breaker 1-9 video or uh, CB radios. He hits me up one day uh, because him and I were, we had become friends and he asks me to meet him at this particular address. Um, I didn't know the address at the time, but it was his house. But he can't say on the radio that everybody can hear, hey, meet me at my house, because then people would know we're messing around on the clock. Show up to his house. There's four other technicians there. And the reason why he called us to the house was because he had just bought an aquarium. Now, Art was a very active guy. He could do a lot of things, but lifting heavy, super heavy things was not something that he could do because of his situation. So he had four of us there to pick up this aquarium and put it in place. Uh, it was a 240 gallon, which to me was like, I didn't even think you could put something like this in your house. Like it was so big. Like you were talking about, you know, a 29 gallon tank back in those days was big. This was 1993. A 240 gallon tank was like, I only thought these were ever seen in a public aquarium, like not somebody's living room. Um, but it didn't really have all that much of an effect on me. I was actually kind of upset. I was like, man, I got 12 calls left to go to today and I got to go help him carry this thing. We put the tank up onto the stand, which he built himself into the wall. And that was that, you know, he started working on setting up the filtration, which was a big, uh, sump system, which I didn't even know what that was at the time. I was looking at it like, how can you have two aquariums and there's not going to be any fish in that one in the bottom? Like this doesn't make sense. Um, but that's, you know, I was seeing for the first time a sophisticated filtration system like that, because again, with art being a wealthy guy, if he could do something, he was going to go all in and do it right. So I looked at that as I am on the clock and I'm with my boss, so I can't get in trouble so this is all free time for me. Uh, you know, I considered myself lucky to be there to watch him put this thing that I had no interest in to watch him put it together. Fast forward because Art did this the right way. Fast forward about a month and a half. I get another call from him on the radio. John, meet me at this address. Uh, this was a different address. I didn't know what the address was. We didn't have GPS back then. So I just had to go to the address. The address was a store in Woodbridge, Virginia called Creatures and Critters. I assumed, because I was on the clock, I assumed that I was there to work. Because, you know, being a cable television, it was very different back in the 90s. You didn't have streaming and all that kind of stuff. Basically, all anybody had was, uh, was cable TV. So it was not uncommon at all for there to be cable in businesses. They'd have a TV up in the corner with where I live, Fox News or, you know, CNN or something up on the TV. So I assumed the cable in this business was broken. So I grab my tools and I go in, I start walking in. Well, Art is in his Bronco, which was his company vehicle, not an OJ Simpson Bronco, but the small Broncos. He gets out and he says, now, listen, Jason, you know me very well. And a, and a lot of people on my YouTube channel will know me I say this all the time. I got it from him. I, he, he gets out of his truck and he says, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm here to, wh what? What do you got going on in there? You need me to fix the cable? He says, no, dummy, put your tools away. We're going in there to buy fish. So calling people dummy is not nice. I do it all the time though. And it's because of Art Clark. So I'm like, okay, cool. I get free time again. I put my tools away. We go in there. I have absolutely no interest in what he's doing. Like, Art's going to be in there. Art was a guy, and I don't mean to refer to him in the past tense. I, I, he's not dead, but I haven't spoke to him in a long time. We didn't have a falling out. We just drifted apart, and now we live in different states. Um, he was a lot like, I'm not going to say a woman, but he was a lot like Lisa when it comes to shopping. 
I don't know if Joanne is this way, uh, Jason, but it drives me crazy. I don't like going to a store with Lisa at all because she is going to look at every single thing in said store. If it's Walmart, we're going to be there for an hour. And this is a woman that says she hates shopping. But anyway, Art was like that too. He was going to go through and he was going to look into every tank and inspect every single fish. And it was going to take all day if he had to. He didn't care. Well, that got very boring to me. I do one little quick run through the store and I'm like, okay, I'm over it. And he's like, well, hang out. You know, you got to see what I end up getting. I'm sitting there waiting for him. And I look at the back of the store. You talk about the back of your local pet store having an impact on you. Well, the same thing happened to me, except it wasn't a a fancy display room. It was simply two tanks, which I later learned were 180s, built into the wall, one right next to each other. One was salt water. One was fresh water. The salt water one had... One fish in it, which was a lionfish that was the size of a basketball. Absolutely massive. I was fascinated by that, but had no interest. It didn't catch me like, oh, that's something I want to do. But the tank next to it had a silver arowana that was over two feet long and an albino tiger Oscar. And I saw those and I said, oh, And I'm standing there, the employee is there, and he's holding a little bucket. He's standing next to me, and I said, that is so cool. I've never seen anything like that. Wouldn't that be cool to have something like that, like, in my home? Because I looked at it, this arowana, that's not something you can have at home in an aquarium. Look how big that thing is. You know, fish that you put in aquariums are this big. Like, that's, I I just put my fingers up about two inches for those listening on audio. Uh, fish are really small. You don't have big giant fish like that. And the guy said, Oh yeah, we'll look right over there. And he pointed to an aquarium that had little five inch long silver arowanas in it. And that's when it hit me like, Oh, I can have something like this in my house. And I start freaking out with the employee there. And he says, well, you want to see something even cooler? Watch this. And I I hate this now, but at the time I was 19 years old. I was, you know, completely mesmerized by this that little bucket that he was holding was full of feeder goldfish. And he said, watch the glitter show. And I'm like, what? So he throws like a a bunch into the, um, the, the lionfish tank and they just instantaneously disappear. Like it was almost like the lionfish had its mouth open and he just dropped the goldfish right into its mouth. That wasn't all that entertaining, but the arowana tank, he put those air, the goldfish in there. They were an inch and a half long. To watch that arowana hunt those fish, to watch that fish sneak up on them. I'm horrified by this now, but back then I'm 19 and dumb. I'm like, oh, oh, it's building this anticipation. And then boom, it hits the goldfish and the goldfish explodes into this glitter party all over the tank, which was the goldfish's scales, which is horrifying to hear now. And I'm completely against, but back then I was like, well, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. I must do this. And so that right there is what I I walked out of the store knowing I'm coming back and I'm buying one of those arowanas. Uh, And I, I asked the employee while I was there, I was like, you know, I don't have a mansion. I can't put one of these six foot long tanks in my house. And he told me again, this is 1993. He said, well, you don't have to worry about that. There's two reasons why that's not a problem with arowanas. One is they're going to grow to the size of the tank. And two is and this is horrible. He said, the good thing about arowanas is they're jumpers. And so with them being jumpers, you want to limit the the possibility of them being able to jump and so if you have them in a shorter tank they don't have the room to build up the speed to be able to jump out of the tank anybody that knows anything about arowanas knows that that's completely ridiculous they don't get gain speed by building momentum they basically coil up like a snake and strike out of the water so they can do that in any size aquarium So that was ridiculous that he said that. Obviously, this guy knew nothing about keeping fish. uh, And he was an employee at a pet store. But in his defense, it was a full-line pet store. He was also young. He looked like he was the same age as me. So he didn't know anything. And really, nobody knew anything back then. 
So I looked at it as, well, I can put an arowana in a smaller tank and it'll be fine. It's not going to hurt that fish at all. I'll have one of these absolutely mesmerizing fish in my living room. I can't wait. Now, this was 1993. I was probably making $7.50 an hour. It's not like I could just pull the money out of my pocket. I wasn't art. I couldn't just pull the money out of my pocket and buy the fish tank right there. Otherwise, I would have. This had to be something that was a long-term plan. At the time uh, that this all this happened, I was finishing uh, my basement in a townhouse that my ex and I had bought when we were 19 years old. We bought a foreclosure townhouse that had an unfinished basement. I was finishing the basement. I was building a laundry room. And in that laundry room, I wanted to do the fanciest thing in the world. And I wanted to build a niche in the wall that would hold my television. Now, there was no such thing as hanging TVs on walls back then because TVs weighed 150 pounds. So you built a nook to put the, the, te the television in, the big 32-inch tube television that was just this massive thing. And my idea was, how can I incorporate an aquarium into there too? My neighbor at the time, which I was good friends with, was a, a framer. He was a contractor. And I, he came over and he was like, oh, we can do this and do the, do the, and he started coming up with this design and he said, but you know what you could do even better if you use this area here, you could put the TV here and then have two aquariums, one on top of each other. And I'm like, well, hello, that's perfect. That you're making my dreams come true. And the only space I had in that setup was for two 29 gallons. Here we are again with 29s. Um, stacked on top of each other. But to me, that was the coolest thing in the world. Uh, we went, I bought just the glass boxes first, because first of all, all my money was going into this, this construction. I didn't have the money to buy everything else, but I bought those so that we could frame around them and build the wall. And then once all of that was done, I went back and I got my two under gravel filters. Cause you know, state of the art. Uh, I got my air pumps, my heaters, and, uh, and I set them all up probably two or three months after that encounter with the arowanas at the Creatures and Critters. And it was a silver arowana that I bought for one tank. And a not, they didn't have albinos, but I bought a regular Tiger Oscar for the tank below him. And that was, that was what got me started. So, yes, I, the guy who makes a living now educating people on the proper way to keep Oscars, uh, I don't call myself an expert, but it's what I do for a living. I put an Oscar in a 29, and I also put an arowana in a 29. Uh, I'm ashamed to say that now, but back then, you know, we didn't know anything, and the people that were selling us stuff didn't know anything. We thought that we were doing the right thing. Um, that's how it started for me, uh, and I became completely obsessed. I ended up adding three more tanks in that basement, uh, one of which was a 125, which I moved the arowana up into. I think I went through three arowanas, uh, and one of them is uh, what I will save for our episode if we ever do one on our greatest fish keeping mistakes. Mm. That'll be one to save for that episode. But I, I think I went through three arowanas. One of them passed because uh, my house sitter, when I was on my first honeymoon uh, overfed this fish to death um, but I did get one that got to a really good size probably 20 inches or so in the 125 and then long story short my father passed away my mother actually ended up asking my ex-wife and I to move in move back in with her and so at that point my dad had just died I was 23 years old I didn't care anymore it was like I just got to get out of this and I, I basically gave all the fish away to a local pet store, not Creatures and Critters. Um, and then I threw everything else away, which is tragic now, but I didn't have time to mess around with it. Um, there was a period of a couple of years after that where I didn't have aquariums at all because I was living in my mom's house. Uh, but once everything, you know, my mom had not been alone in 34 years. And so once, you know, she got settled and we were all good there, uh, we bought another house and moved out and I started keeping aquariums again. The thing was, uh, and maybe this has a lot to do with why she's my ex-wife. My ex was never really interested in it. She didn't hate it, 
but she was, she tolerated it basically. Um, I was with her when I started in the hobby. So she, she didn't know me as this fish keeping guy. Uh, I wasn't one when we met, I became one after we met. And then, um, she just kind of got used to that and she tolerated it, but it didn't really, she had no interest in it. Um, so her and I, we didn't last much longer. <laughs> and, uh, well, it, it was, you know, mid two thousands, uh, her and I parted ways, uh, met Lisa in 2009 and I, because I had just recently, you know, a year earlier gone through a separation, I didn't have any aquariums at the time. And I was, sad to, to say this, admit it, uh, in my mid thirties, uh, living with my mother, but it was one of those things where I just got separated. I, my, my mom was like, I got a room, come stay here. And it was until we figured all that out, I was going to stay at my mom's place and, uh, didn't have any aquariums at my mom's place. But when I got out of there, you know, the whole divorce thing was all done and child support. Uh, I received child support. I got custody of my daughter. Um, my daughter and I got a place. We rented a house in King George, Virginia, and the, Lisa and I were already a thing at the time, and uh, and that's when I started getting back into aquariums again. And so, again, when when Lisa and I met, I wasn't I was a fish keeper, but she didn't know because I didn't have any set up at the time. But as soon as I had the opportunity, I started setting them up again, and and where it was so different from the past was she was almost instantly interested in this hobby as interested as I was. And that was an absolute game changer. Uh, that was, I'm not exaggerating here. That was life changing because now I had something that I could share with her. Um, she went head over heels for this hobby. Her fi first fish was also an arowana. Uh, it was a match made in heaven. And, you know, I've talked in great length in the past about how uh, fish keeping quite literally saved Lisa and I's relationship. I'm not going to get into all of that because the story is way too long. But uh, there was a time where Lisa and I were not sure that things were going to continue. But it was me being called to the rescue of a sick fish that brought us back together again. And I understand completely how cheesy that sounds but these are absolute facts that i'm sharing with you um when her and i merged our households and we became a blended family um that's when you know i could go into this story much more detail later on but uh that's when her and i started breeding fish started by accident we loved it we started breeding fish on purpose our hobby grew from a small room in our house to the three car detached or a three car attached garage that we had that like you, it got out of control very fast. I, we ended up with 127 aquariums in a three car garage that her and I were taking care of. And I got to tell you, I'm like you, I am an extraordinarily lucky man. And every single day, I, I don't have to remind myself of how lucky I am. Every single day I'm reminded how lucky I am. So I love my life so much. But what I can tell you is for the few years that her and I had aquariums in that garage and we were there taking care of the tanks, our, the two of us, we were watching the fish breed. We were raising the fry. It was the best few years of our lives as, as far as fish keeping lives. Uh, I can tell you a lot of examples of better parts of my life, but in my fish keeping career spanning from now all the way back to 1993, this was the best fun I've ever had in this hobby. And then we went and screwed it all up by renting a shop and doing all that. You know, we won't get into all that, but um, that's kind of how it's, how it started and how it evolved. And then became something that that my wife and I do together. And now we make a living doing it. And I am extraordinarily lucky. Uh, there are bad days, not between Lisa and I, we're the best of friends, which is such a blessing. But, um, you know, when it becomes your job, you have bad days. And, and it is what it is. But I'm very lucky to have the life I have. I'm very lucky to have aquariums like the one sitting behind me eight feet by three feet by two feet with my favorite fish in it 
Well, it's my second favorite fish. I don't have arowanas in there, but I have three Oscars in there. And what has replaced arowanas for me, which are bikers, bashirs, whatever you want to call them, uh, they're the thing that I am the most passionate about now. Still love my arowanas, still dream of someday the government of the United States to allow us to have Asian arowanas. I will be there day one to get one if they're ever available. Um, still absolutely love arowanas, but it doesn't matter what fish are in it. I love the concept of a glass box full of water. And if I have any complaint about it right now is that because I have a business, we ha Lisa and I have a website, keepfishkeeping.com. We have our YouTube channel. We have now this podcast. Uh, because we have so many things going on, I don't have as much time in the fish room as I'd like. The time that I'm in the fish room now, I'm working, which is fine. And when I say working, I mean, you know, maintaining the tanks and cleaning out filters and doing all that, fixing a leak that I have to fix in my saltwater tank. There's always work to be done. I'm not sitting and just enjoying the fish and, and looking around like, oh, look, I just saw a little baby pop out from the rocks in my yellow lab tank. I, I don't get to enjoy that as much as I'd like to. But hopefully someday uh, in the near future, maybe we can bring somebody in to help us out with our fulfilling orders for our website and also maintaining the tanks. And I can have a little bit more fun time just enjoying the aquariums. But again, that's not a complaint. I'm very lucky to do what I do for a living. I love my life. Um, I just wish I was able to, you know, enjoy the aquariums a little bit more to get that feeling back that I had way back in the day where it was just something to enjoy and not, not a job. Um, I, I'm, tr I'm trying desperately not to bring anybody down the dumps. I'm not looking for sympathy and I'm not complaining. I'm just saying, you know, it would be nice to, to be able to get back to that again. So, uh, but that in a nutshell is, is what got it all started for me and made me one of the luckiest men on the planet. You know, you brought up a really good point too, and that's something that I think we will be talking about at some point in the future, is at what point does the hobby stop being a hobby and become something different? So for some people, when it goes from a hobby to something different, that's a good thing. Uh, that's what they, they thoroughly enjoy, and I know that you've taken that transition, as have I, but there are some significant drawbacks to doing that, and you've just barely touched on a few. I know that from my perspective, when you go from if you just have a few tanks, you'll study those aquariums. You'll know every single yep. fish, all their tendencies. You'll know all of the community dynamics. You'll know every single thing about those aquariums, but you cannot possibly do that when you start getting 15, 20, 30, 40. You had 127. I got up to about 80. Those, those days are gone. You're, you're just yeah. simply not going to have that kind of a connection. And so there's a significant trade-off. And then you also mentioned having the fish store and that's a different thing altogether as well, because now they're not even in your home. They're at a store and you're not necessarily paying attention to them the way that you would if they were in your home. And so it's one advantage we still kind of have, not kind of we do, is when we bring in so many, literally thousands of fish every four to six weeks, they're still in our house. Yeah. I'm still there three, four times a day. I'm still watching them. And it's not, a, it's not necessarily a pet store. I just kind of walk by and I'm like, hey, employee, there's three dead fish over there. Go grab them. So we still <laughs> get to learn a lot about their personalities and dynamics. But that is a conversation we can have in much greater detail at some point in the future because it's one that should be had. Yeah. And it, you know what? It's something that I've done twice in my adult life. Uh, I've been a woodworker my entire life. It is the thing that, you know, it's fish keeping, it's woodworking, and there's a new thing now. Uh, which I'll touch on, but uh, every single thing that I've done as a hobby, I've turned into a job. Uh, woodworking was the same way. I, I ended up having a custom cabinetry shop and, uh, and that was great. Again, I would have told you the same thing I'm telling you now when I was doing that, I was considering myself very, very lucky. And I, I actually told my business partner back, this would have been like 2006, I was telling him, we've got to figure out a way to like set up a camera in this shop to just film me working because mm -hmm. I was building custom cabinetry, but I was also restoring old furniture. I'm like, we could become a, our own DIY channel. Uh, and he was like, that's ridiculous. Why would anybody do that? You know, I guess I was kind of seeing the future, <laughs> but when you're doing it for a job, it does become something completely different. You're lucky to do it, 
but you're not looking at it the same as you would if it was just something that, that you were enjoying as a hobby. And you, you talk about it being when we were when we had it at the store, they're separate from our home. We're not seeing them every day. Which we went to the shop every day, but it, it's different than seeing them in your home. Well, we kind of have that now. And the funny thing is, when Lisa and I had our shop, it was about as far away from our home as our fish house is from our home now. Uh, it was right across the street from our house. It was across the street and three doors down. So it wasn't even a block away. And so we had to, we, we would drive because we lived on a busy highway. But even now, I, I know how ridiculous this sounds, but you have to be in my shoes to understand it. You know, it's you have to put forth an effort to get up and and walk. It's 300 feet. It's not like I live in a property where my building is a mile and a half away from my house. It's right there, but it's still detached from the house. And there are days, thankfully, my wife is, is brilliant and she maintains a lot of the stuff, not my tanks, but everything else in the fish house. Uh, so everything's taken care of. There's days where I won't even come out here at all. Mm -hmm. And, and I hate that about it so much. I, I want to change that. Um, and I, and I want to stop the trend of whatever it is that I do just for love, uh, trying to make money at it. Lisa and I are our new favorite thing to do that has nothing to do with work or anything to do with fish keeping. We like to play the game darts. We play it together every single night. Uh, it's something that we absolutely love. And there's one thing I can promise you. I will never be somebody who makes money from playing darts <laughs> because even if I wanted to, it's not going to happen. But it's so much fun. And, and the, the feelings that I have with that playing with her every night in my office is similar to the feelings we had when we first started fish keeping together back in the day. Um, and, you know, I, hopefully I don't ever screw that up by trying to enter tournaments to win money and darts and all of that. I don't want all that. But, well, um, but it is lucky to be able to do what we do. And I, I don't want anybody to, to think I feel otherwise. Well, and it's funny you mentioned that too, because Joanne and I had talked about, we ride motorcycles. We have Harleys, we go all over the place, um, take some long trips. And last year we were contemplating, should we start up a motorcycle vlog, YouTube channel sort of mm -hmm. thing? And I'm like, it's just our, it's, it's our natural inclination to want to do this stuff. And I'm yep. like, you know, she's like, well, you, you know, I'm like, we can do product reviews. We can review different. And I'm like, hold on a second. We do the motorcycles as a complete just detach, have yes. fun, no pressure. You know, when it, with, with fish, something happens when your fish go from pets to products. And that's True. what happens when you are in retail and you have to be really careful that your fish are still pets. And, and thankfully in our fish room, even though we're bringing so many in, they're still pets, but it is really, really easy. And you have to fight the, the idea of going from pets to products that you're selling. Because once you cross that line, it, it doesn't lead anywhere good. And that's right. So it's you just have to be really careful with that. And the, the motorcycle thing, I think we've kind of decided. Although I'm not promising anything that yeah, we're probably not going to do that. I don't really want to because then you're you're under pressure. We got to put out a video. We got to do this. Oh, social media. Then I've got to answer these comments. Got to review this thing. And it's like I don't want to do any of that. I just want to yep. go out and enjoy the stuff. Not that I don't like. Like you said, I enjoy fish keeping tremendously as you as you do but uh, it does change things when you are now posting stuff and and making a career out of it yeah i did exactly what you're talking about not not with motorcycles although i did used to own a motorcycle and now that i live in a very rural area i'm considering possibly putting you my need that street glide you need that street glide man i i mean hey you know we'll see but uh but i Lisa and I purchased a home in Northeast North Carolina that was originally built in 1830. My house predates the Civil War. Um, it's, it's another dream come true for me. We, we did not buy an expensive property, folks. It sounds like it might be, but it's not. Uh, we, we got a very good deal on this place, and I'm so privileged to have it. I got to be honest with you. I made a mistake. I did exactly what you're talking about. One of my dreams I've always had in my adult life is to buy an old house and renovate it. Well, what did we do in 2022? We bought an old house and I'm starting the process of renovating it. And I made the mistake of starting a YouTube channel to document all of that. And I love it. It's fun. But at the same time, it's like, 
I would love to just be able to go out there and work on that project and not set up cameras, not plan what I'm going to say, not be on an upload schedule. So there's only been two uploads to that channel. <laughs> and, and as a matter of fact, the day that this podcast uploads is when the second video will upload. Um, but it, you know, it does change it. Uh, yeah. and, it, and it's one of those things where it's just like, I wish I could just enjoy it and not be thinking about mm -hmm. making a video about it. And, and don't get it twisted for anybody that is not a content creator. Uh, YouTube is a job. It is definitely a job. It's a great job and I'm very lucky to have it, but it is, it does become work and that, that does complicate things. But Hey, listen, you know, I don't want to continue to dig that hole, making it look like I don't appreciate what I do for a living because I definitely do very lucky. I'm lucky to do it. And I'm also lucky to be doing this now with you. I, I think it's going to be absolutely amazing. Uh, the plans that we have for this podcast are vast. Yep. Uh, Jason and I live halfway across the country from each other. And that does pose a challenge. I think you agree with me, Jason. There is no better way to have a conversation than face to face. That is and absolutely true. We have talked about, we, we kind of are face to face now, but when I'm looking at Jason, I'm actually looking at the lens of a camera, which is weird, but uh, we're going to do remote podcasts by necessity, but we do get together a minimum of three times per year. We've already discussed the idea of uh, blocking out a day when we meet at these events, not during the events because, you know, we're doing the events, but uh, blocking out a day to dedicate strictly to recording podcasts where we are face to face. And, uh, and the good thing about it is when we do get together, we're at an event where a lot of the industry is there and we can pull some of those people in and, and talk to them, to them about the industry about, you know, all kinds of things involving fish keeping. Uh, so I'm excited about that. And then we've also talked about, you know, meeting halfway and, uh, you know, renting a hotel room specifically for the purposes of recording a bunch of episodes so that we're not doing this remote thing. Uh, I don't think the remote episodes are going to be bad, but no. it definitely will be different when we're, when we're sitting face to face. In fact, we've done these sitting face to face and uh we know it's a lot easier yeah, to do it sure. that way um yep. one of the times that we did that was at your house sitting in the room that you're sitting in right now <laughs> we did a podcast together and and i do have to say when jason was talking about his fish room uh i have been there and it is a beautiful beautiful place to be your boys do an amazing job keeping that thing up uh you've done a good job with those kids because they, they obviously take pride in their work. The, the fish room is beautiful. I know it looks completely different now. I'll, I'll, I assume I'll be seeing it in August or whenever it is that I'll oh, yeah. be in, in your area. Um, I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to see the changes that you've made. And, you know, maybe someday there might be a reason to get you out here to the coastal plains of North Carolina and uh, you can sit across from me. For sure. So, yeah, I mean, I think that was, that's who we are. These are that's the it. fish keep. These are the fish keepers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Now, you know, a PBS yeah. message. Uh, do you have a problem with me referring to you as the professor? I have no problems with that whatsoever. Good. Like I said, it's what my stu students ask me all the time. What, 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 what do we call him? Like everybody is, there's two things that people have called me in my life besides my name, professor and coach. And I don't mind either one of them. I just had one of my former players, but I coached baseball from the time my kids could hold a baseball bat until the time they went to high school. And I have, I still see my former players. And just yesterday, I'm on a treadmill here. Hey coach. And now <laughs> of course, they're in even my younger players that were, you know, Eli's age, they're all sophomore juniors in high school. And I'm like, who's this kid? And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so and so, you know. So yeah, it's always and sometimes what's even funnier is one semester, my students started calling me coach one summer because they knew that I was coaching two baseball teams and I was super busy and I was always running off the practice and games. And so it's like there was a couple of softball player girls there and they're like, all right, coach. And everybody called me coach that semester so one of well, those two is usually <laughs> i i'm not going to call you coach i want to call you professor because 
I, you're a good friend of mine. I, I don't feel like I need to brown nose you at all, but I think it's a show of respect. You've earned that title. And also, uh, it, it kind of, you know, solidifies, hey, listen, this is a guy you should listen to because he's a freaking professor. Well, so, I don't know about that. Maybe on some things, but <laughs> hey, you've there, earned it. A lot said for experience, too. We, we, you know, what do you want to be called? Uh, Grandmaster Fishkeeper? Uh, no, no, absolutely not. No, um, you know, I know it's complicated and it, and it might seem weird, but um, I just like being called John. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's good because, you know, that's a, that's a good name. It's, so it's a good many name. people in our industry refer to me as KG. They, hey, KG, come here. You know, I've got close friends that call me that. And yeah. uh, I got to be honest, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of that. But um, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you my nickname that I had growing up because kind of embarrassing and there's absolutely no chance you will not call me that so uh, you know for the purposes of continuity so that everybody knows who i am uh i think john is probably the right answer there there so, you go now we've got it settled so we future could change, we could change the name of the podcast to john and the professor <laughs> i'm yeah, joking right. no yeah. man we just got all this branding done what are you doing man <laughs> um go back and rename everything <laughs> but I'm looking forward to it. We got some cool stuff coming up. So if you're listening, we've got a whole bunch of things. Uh, our plan is what we're going to release every, at least right now, every Monday. Is that what we decided? Monday. I'll have so it up Mondays? for people to listen to on their way to work on Monday, at nice. 6 a.m. Yeah. Eastern time, something like that. Uh, yeah, it'll be ready. Very cool. And we'll have periodic posts if you haven't already done so. Obviously, you found us on the podcasting platforms or on YouTube. But we will also be on Instagram. We're on TikTok, the Tank Talk podcast on TikTok, TikTok, TikTok. Uh, <laughs> and then on Instagram, uh, tank underscore talk underscore podcast. Uh, so we're there as well. We'll do some short form uh, little clips and stuff of what's coming up and what has been. So, yeah, there'll be a lot of cool things coming up. I'm excited about it. I will make sure uh, I, I'm I don't think we've established yet. I'm going to be the one that's uploading the audio form. I, I think I'll be also uploading the video. I don't know who's going to handle the description of the video and all that. But regardless, we will make sure that all of the social medias, all of the places that you can get a hold of us are in the description of whatever it is that you're watching this on. And I want I'm glad I thought of this because we talked about it prior to, to pushing record. Um, we want to hear from you and hear your questions or maybe your stories. You want to tell your story of how you got involved. I don't know if YouTube limits how many uh, characters you can type in, but we'd like you to do that on the YouTube channel. If you're listening to this on a Apple podcast or something like that. There's nowhere for you to comment unless you read a re write a review, which we'd love for you to do. But uh, to communicate with us, the best way to do it would be to go to that YouTube channel to any video and just put it in the comment section. And what Jason and I have agreed to do is every week we will go and we will find one of those comments and we will address those, whether it's a good story, a good question, a, a statement, whatever it is. So if you want to be a part of that, you're going to want to do that on the YouTube channel. Now, you do need to be aware, Jason and I, because we live halfway across the country from each other and because we both have full-time jobs, we are batch recording these episodes. We'll be recording multiple episodes in one day. And so if you put those comments up now, you're not going to probably see us address those within the next four weeks because we're recording four episodes today. So just be aware of that all the more reason to get your comments in now that way when Jason and I sit down again to record more episodes we can go through and we can find the right ones to address and uh, and we can address those we'll do it you know at the end of every episode or something like that we'll take a a question or a statement from you and we'll address it on the podcast so make sure you're a subscriber to the YouTube channel and make sure you put those comments in and uh, we can involve you in the show this is a beautiful thing. Episode one is done and I'm very excited about it. Let's uh, let's move on and let's talk about episode two next. Let's do it.